Hey guys, it's Mrs. Wallace. Um, this is a video for anyone that missed class uh, just because of Zoom technology, just a lot of things sometimes going on. Um, if you missed class, I'm just going to do a really short video on uh, some of the Aztec sources that we talked about during class. And um, just a little bit of context here. You know, remember that if you were uh, looking at the Columbus um, assignment and some of the sources related to Columbus that the uh, country, you know, the Spanish, Spain, um, which is at this point, you know, starting some empire building um, under Isabella and Ferdinand, but then continuing under um, Charles V, um, there is a um, movement for the country of Spain <clears throat> to expand some initiatives. Um, sometimes we refer to these as uh, conquests. Um, in some cases, it's missions because the Roman Catholic Church is involved. Uh, so there's a few different levels of the way in which this occurs, but there are definitely some initiatives that are military on oriented that are um, happening uh, either to the Caribbean. So under Columbus, for example, we know that Columbus travels to the Caribbean, you know, and travels there four different times. And he's a political leader at a certain point. And there are other um, Spanish leaders who are put in uh, positions of power. And that has a huge impact impact, uh, for example, on the Taino, and we will see over time the area of the Caribbean largely become uh, sugar uh, plantations. And so that's not going to be exclusive only to Spain. We're going to see France and England and uh, the Dutch, you know, all involved in kind of putting their flag down in some of the Caribbean islands and uh, largely having places where we don't see a lot of European settlers, but largely Africans who are enslaved, who are set to work on these sugar plantations, which are like horrific, horrific uh, systems. Uh, the process of refining sugar to turn it into, um, you know, cubes of sorts, these sh molded shapes, you know, that people would then purchase um, in Europe and put on their bread uh, was, you know, really, really, uh, you know, horrific uh, levels of work. It required burning the sugar cane and a great deal of labor intensive uh, activity and the mortality rate was really, really high. So, you know, that had been kind of initiated in the Caribbean. Um, but Spain and some of the other um, societies in Europe don't necessarily stop with the Caribbean, right? There's going to be other um, conquests. And so uh, one that we'll take a look at is the example of Spain um, in South America and also in Mesoamerica. So like modern day Mexico, the area of Mexico City um, at the time that uh, we are going to be talking about in the 1500s um, is the uh, the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. So um, if you had a chance to watch the video, you have a little bit of an idea of um, the Aztec lifestyle. So if you didn't do that yet, maybe do that first. There's um, uh, an assignment on Schoology that's all about the Aztecs and kind of their pre-conquest lifestyle. Um, very sophisticated society. Tenochtitlan is very interesting, a massive city, probably a home to about 200,000 people, maybe more. Um, in the surrounding area, you had millions of people, so it's a very large uh, populated area, and the Aztecs politically kind of sit on top of what's a very large empire with nearby uh, tribal groups um, having a tribute that they're paying to the Mexica, which is the dominant Aztec group. So we might call all of the folks in this area um, Aztecs. It's not really an ethnicity. It's a name that gets assigned later. Um, but these various different um, groups end up um, taken over by the Mexica, which become the dominant group somewhere around the 13 and 1400s. So by the 1500s, what the Spanish walk into is a pretty oppressive climate where the Mexica are essentially acquiring tribute from the rest of the Aztec uh, group. And um, there is um, a lot of oppression and a great deal of dissatisfaction, and the Spanish are going to uh, take advantage of that. Um, uh, Cortez, Hernan Cortez, who's the leader of a group of about 500 plus Spanish uh, soldiers, um, arrives from Cuba, and he's under direct orders not to go to Tenochtitlan, and of course, what does he do? He defies those orders, and along the way, he writes to Charles V to explain why he took this action. Okay, so we have a lot of description from the words of Cortez about what he does and what he sees, and he is also describing Tenochtitlan in very favorable terms, a massive city. It is very, very merchant heavy. There's a lot of goods for sale. 
the goods are available in a lot of different uh, streets, you know, within Tenochtitlan. Um, and he also does find out some things like, for example, the um, human sacrifice that was being practiced, okay? Um, what we want to do in this video and what we did in class, if you missed it, is we looked at some sources. So in addition to the letters that we have from Cortez, which are very descriptive from his point of view, which are authored um, in uh, Spanish to Charles V, um, and also in some cases intercepted by um, uh, Hernan Cortez's uh, supervisors in Cuba and sometimes even changed up. So these letters are interesting and some of them are missing. We don't have all of the pieces, but we do have some uh, story from uh, Cortez. We also have some Aztec perspective and the Aztec sources are kind of interesting. There are Aztec sources that are pictorial, okay, meaning they're drawings from before the Aztec uh, saw conquest, you know, before the Spanish came. Uh, but those sources were largely destroyed by the Spanish. So most of the sources that we have that are from the Aztec perspective are actually post-conquest and were designed not at the moment that conquest happened. It's not like somebody is sitting there and drawing, this is what happened between Montezuma and Cortez, but rather they are done decades later with second generation Aztecs who are telling the story. And sometimes those Aztecs who are telling the story represent the Mexica, which was the dominant group, and sometimes they represent like the Tuxcala or another group that was being oppressed and actually sided with the Spanish. So there's a variety of different ways that um, these sources could have different perspectives in them. They are generally generally um, pictorial sources, and this one happens to be from the Florentine Codex. It's called the Florentine Codex because the Codex is like a compiled source uh, that's dated. So you could look at the Florentine Codex chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and they have different dates. Um, mostly it is uh, pictographs, so there are depictions of, say, Montezuma or of the human sacrifice, but they are also annotated, and they are annotated in uh, Nahua, so Nahuatl, which is like the language of the majority of the Aztecs, the Mexica in particular, um, and then some people also speak Maya, so you might have some language that's Mayan. Um, you might also have some of this translated into Latin or into Spanish, so um, this whole project of making these books, these codices, and telling the Aztec story is done by Aztecs but under Spanish rule. So um, some Franciscan friars, basically some Roman Catholic monks, had um, come to uh, New Spain while Spanish uh, political system was in charge. This is decades after the conquest, and they decided to ask the Aztecs, you know, what happened from your point of view? Let's document that. And how accurate it is, is hard to tell because the Aztecs are telling the story largely for a Spanish audience. So um, it remains to be debated, you know, how much these sources are uh, distinct, okay? This is an example of one of the pictographs, and this is one that that is um, recent, so it's like probably a um, doctored version of something that was in the Florentine Codex, but this is supposed to represent Montezuma on top of his palace on the eve of um, uh, conquest, right? So we might see this kind of comet or shooting star, and it looks like, like a little ominous, right? That maybe this comet is going to hit the ground, and um, maybe this is a symbol of something that's going to happen. Some historians look at this source and suggest, from the Aztec perspective, this tells us that A, Montezuma, who was the leader of the Aztecs, um, the uh, leader in Techno, te, uh, Tenochtitlan that had kind of a large, um, you know, handle on, on things, and he was like a warrior of sorts, and a lot of Aztec culture is based on a warrior class and a noble class and merchants, so there's a great deal of activity that kind of lines up with other societies that we looked at. There's also slaves, and of course there's a great number of prisoners of war who are from other nearby groups and maybe have been taken uh, for the purpose of being used in a human sacrifice. So the Aztecs were known for human sacrifice, but you know Montezuma in particular sometimes is displayed as a very superstitious individual. Uh, the History Channel certainly subscribes to that particular story, and it's very possible that that's the case. From this type of source, we might get the impression that he was like reading the signs, right? That this ominous thing was about to happen, and maybe he truly believed that there was something um, kind of on the horizon. And so when the Spanish show up, he sees it in some sort of like end 
end of the you know, universe type of lens. Um, it's also possible, and some historians argue, listen, this is the Aztecs telling the story later on to a Spanish audience, and they're showcasing Montezuma, who basically maybe surrendered the land or lost the war, um, maybe describing it's kind of an out for him that maybe there was some sort of sign that this was uh, inevitable or meant to be. And so it could be kind of a second generation reading of the actual, um, you know, situation and may not necessarily mean that Montezuma definitely was superstitious. Um, this is from the Florentine Codex. So this is one of the accurate, um, not accurate, but um, actual drawings that would have been included in like the 1570s version of the Aztec source. And this is um, uh, kind of attributed to a Spanish missionary, uh, somebody by the name of Bernardino uh, de uh, San Hagun. And he is uh, the kind of Roman Catholic uh, monk, you know, in charge of this project. Uh, but what we have here is Lama Linche, who is um, this woman who is in the middle here. She's represented in quite a few of the Aztec sources. In Aztec society, in Mexican society today, uh, she's sometimes looked at as a traitor because she does side with the Spanish. But she's also, um, in some ways, a victim of the situation as well. She had been sold into slavery as a young woman and uh, was given as a gift to Cortez. So, you know, from her perspective, um, her ability to cooperate might have been her only outlet for, you know, survival. And she becomes kind of a confidant of Cortez, not necessarily by choice. It's not necessarily that she falls in love with Cortez, even though that's certainly not impossible. Um, the way that the sources read, she's a much younger, you know, woman than he is. He's in his 30s. And ultimately, she is probably um, trying to survive in a really uh, horrific situation where she is really dominated largely by um, men soldiers, Spanish warriors, and she is kind of the in-between the Aztecs and the um, Spanish. Um, these blobs that we see in between are the words, okay? So there's like translation that's going back and forth. There was somebody in Cortez's group that maybe spoke uh, Spanish and Mayan, and uh, La Malinche could speak Mayan, but also uh, Nahuatl and, you know, was able to learn Spanish, so, you know, was able to intercede. And she also helps Cortez out in understanding some of the diplomacy that's required um, in the settings, okay? Um, in this source, which is from the Aztec perspective, it is probably a little more recent. So it's like a doctored version of some of the things we might see in the Florentine Codex. This is a description of the first meeting between Cortez and Montezuma. And, you know, certainly from this, we can see a few things. Um, first of all, you know, there is Montezuma. He is dressed in Aztec clothing. And we see the profiles. This is Aztec art. Um, it is typical to show people in profile form. Uh, we so see Cortez much more as like a front on view. The same with La Malinche, who is behind him. You know, they're both seated kind of on this European style chair. So is Montezuma. Montezuma is like kind of in the air. It's not really clear if he's on um, some sort of ground or not. His feet are kind of uh, floating. Cortez very much grounded. He almost looks like he's standing. Um, it appears that Cortez almost has the upper hand. And some people would interpret this and say, you know, it looks a little bit like Montezuma is uh, weak. At the same time, we also could argue that and say, wait a minute, there's a great deal of wealth depicted. These are things that... Um, Cortez writes about upon seeing Tenochtitlan, uh, Montezuma literally has a zoo in his palace. He has caged animals, a great deal of like specimens. Maybe he was a collector. He was kind of interested in things. There's a great deal of gold. So there's like unique animals and a great deal of wealth. Um, and he's also got his people. According to some of the written sources, there's a thousand people who accompany Montezuma. Cortez goes up to Montezuma to touch him and the people won't let him. So, you know, According to some of the sources, it's very possible that Montezuma has the upper hand. But, you know, we did look at some texts in class, and there are some textbook accounts that suggest Montezuma may have thought that Cortez was a god, right? Why would that be? Because there was this um, legend of Quetzalcoatl, who was an Aztec, you know, kind of god of sorts, who maybe was against human sacrifice, you know, left and is making a comeback. 
Um, a lot of historians suggest that's not the case, right? That that's not accurate. Montezuma probably had no such belief at all, um, sees the Spanish maybe for the first time. There's a meetup that happens before this image um, with Montezuma's like people, some scouts and uh, Cortez. Um, but to picture it up here is kind of this like random individual. It's very possible that this is meant to represent, you know, Quetzalcoatl and maybe um, Montezuma sees uh, Cortez and some type of godlike fashion. In any case, what's significant is oftentimes when we look at the sources, whether they're Aztec created or Spanish created, we see Montezuma as a weaker um, character than Cortez, and some of that is being uh, challenged by historians currently.